That's right. Yep. <clears throat> we uh <clears throat> have not. I repeat, we have not forgotten about any of you when it comes to this selected Bible study. Y'all go with me as we do uh, the Bible study for this evening. Uh, we are working on Micah chapter 6. You have to forgive me as I'm trying to locate my other uh, my other device the phone so i can come from two different devices but anyway turn your bibles to micah chapter six please go to micah chapter six for me Yeah, I was trying to locate it, but for some reason I cannot. All right, so we are pushing towards Micah chapter 6 as we dive right into it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this Bible study. We thank you for your word, knowledge, and understanding, and wisdom, O oh God. And let us not misinterpret your word, but understand the very truth thereof that you will have for us this evening as we study Micah chapter 6. God, you are so good, so wonderful, and so awesome, and there is none like you, and neither can there ever be. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your love. Amen. Micah chapter 6, um, it gives us a very profound understanding. We'll dive right into it, um, and it is it is the woe principles. It is where... Um, it seems as if Yahweh himself is really sending a warning signal to the children of Israel. And we already know that he's been sending warning signals and woes to the children of Israel. We know that uh, for sure. But yet the Lord is really getting into some specific details, <clears throat> so to say. Um, and what it is, 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 of course, Micah, who is prophesying. Right? He's prophesying to them, but yet at the same time, he is giving specific, of course, words of the Lord, or words from the Lord, uh, concerning the children of Israel and warning them. Uh, and anyway, if you join me, Micah 6 says, Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou uh, before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear, O ye mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth for the Lord hath a controversy with his people 
being very, very specific, and he will plead with Israel, Oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me, for I brought thee out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of the servants, and sent thee before thee, and sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what ba uh, Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. In other words, he's saying, I prove myself to, to you. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Question mark. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with calves of a year old? There's a reason for that. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath shewed thee, O man, what is good? And what doeth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, to love, mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. The Lord's, verse, the Lord's voice crieth in the, in the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, who, and who hath appointed it? And there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, and the scant measure that is abominable. Abominable question mark. Eleven says, Shall I count them pure with the wicked with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? There's a reason for that. Twelve says, For the rich man thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, and making thee desolate because of thy sins, thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied, and thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee. And and thou shalt take hold, but shalt not deliver. And that which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. Thou that sh thou shalt sow, but shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint with oil and sweet wine. Thereof an a hissing. Sounds obviously saying, I'm going to erase y'all. Therefore, ye shall bear the reproach of my people. Right? And so he's giving quite a forewarning. He is uh, really, you know, getting into um, grave detail with the children of Israel. He's getting very specific. And... Um, the Lord is 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 really making it known that at the end of the day, uh, the children of Israel have been <clears throat> really a disappointing nation to him. He's given blessings and curses, and this is like the um, the, the 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 third. Um, what do you want to call it? It would be like the third uh, prophecy of of like desolation or punishment that is coming forth to the children of Israel that Micah is reiterating, so to say. And, you know, he, the Lord is using Micah, but um, Micah is simply, you know, just reiterating on his mind, well, not reiterating on his mind, I'm sorry. He's reiterating specifically what the Lord is putting on his mind because at the end of the day, he is a prophet. He is a man of God. And he can't half-step what God gives him. All he can do is belch out exactly what the Lord says. And what's happening is up and down, the Lord is giving, and I'm, and I'm talking about this because up and down, the Lord is giving um, good uh, prophecies to the children of Israel and letting him know that he's a sovereign God, he's sweet, he's forgiven, and he's going to take care of them even though he, they they ticking him off. But then at the same time, he remembers all of their woes and their ups and downs, which is the very reason why Micah has to talk to them in the first place. So watch. So right in 6, he says, and this is Micah, he says, chapter 6, verse 1, he says, listen, Hear ye now what the Lord says, right? 
This is not me talking. This is the Lord. We should have been done with this and I've been behind, but it's okay. Um, he says, hear ye now what the Lord says. And when he says, he, hear ye now what the Lord says, or in their terminology, in the Hebrew terms that they use or the language that they talk, it would be Yahweh. Hear ye now what Yahweh says. It marks the beginning of the third major section of Micah. So this is like the third, that's why I said this is like the third major section or the third major time that he's sending out such a, a um, I don't want to use the word gruesome, but a, a very detrimental <laughs> prophet. And he says, uh, 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 Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. What he's using is a, t a Hebrew terminology that is used also throughout the message when he says, Hear ye now the word of the Lord, or hear now, uh, or plead your cause. Or, you, you see what I'm saying? What, he, what he's doing is that is the type of term terminology used when a prophet um, will denote or proclaim the Lord's covenant because he promised the children of Israel great things. And then he says, I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll do this. And I said, but if you sin against me, I'll also do this, this and that. So that's the covenant lawsuit against those that are guilty from breaking the Lord's laws, which of course the children of Israel were doing. He says, let the hills hear your voice and the mountains what he's basically saying is God is the creator of everything. And when, you, and when you're sinning, children of Israel, even the hills and the mountains is your, is your jury. Because when you make God mad, even the hills and the mountains know better. And they know that God is in control. Even though they don't move and they talk and don't talk, they know that God is in control and ultimately he is the prosecuting attorney. All right, he says, arise, contend before the mountains and let the hills hear. His people, and he will plead with Israel. All right, God is the creator of the very foundation of the earth. And that's why he's using the terminology of the mountains. He's saying, a mountain, a, a earth, hear the content of the Lord. And, the, and when he says contend, he's using another Hebrew word or terminology meaning judge or judgment or the render of a decision. And he says, the Lord is coming to give his opinion. Well, it is more than an opinion, but he's coming to give his petition on the problems that he's having with Israel. Mountains, hills, and earth, you are a witness of what the Lord is about to say and do. So I'm speaking to you first, then I'm talking to the children of Israel directly. Y'all think I'm playing? Watch this. Three says, oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherewith have I wearied thee? Testify against me. So the, so watch this. Oh, it gets so deep. The spirit of the Lord just moved over me. So now he's saying, so now Micah is saying, Mountains, hills, earth, check this out. Hear what the word of the Lord is about to use me to tell the children of Israel. Children of Israel, the Lord is saying, you're sinning greatly. Why do you sin? What have I done to thee? Oh, my people, what have I done to thee? Now the Lord is using Micah to prophesy this, and he's saying, this is what the Lord is going to say them to them. What have I done to thee? Look at three. Question mark. And wherein have I really, what have I done to y'all that is so bad to make y'all sin so horribly against me? And if I've done it, testify against me right now. Yeah. Testify against me. Let us hear your petition. Right? And then he says, uh, 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 uh. testify up against me, tell me what I've done wrong. And then he switches it up right in, 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 in four, verse four. He says, tell me what I've done wrong. And so in other words, it's subliminal. And he's really saying, I ain't done nothing wrong to y'all. Y'all know it. All I did was been good to y'all. I brought y'all up out of Egypt. Look at four. For I brought you out of the land of Egypt and I redeemed thee out of the house of servants. You were Pharaoh's servants, slaves. And I sent to thee before Moses, 
Aaron and Miriam. So when I delivered you, I even gave you great leaders. Okay, Egypt is located on uh, northeastern tip of Africa. Is in and 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 the thing is, is he says, when I brought you out of Egypt from under Mary, uh, from under uh, Pharaoh, I gave you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, which was the leaders of Israel when the nation was redeemed from from Egypt. All right, and of Aaron was Moses' brother. Of course, we know that, and Miriam was Moses' sister. So he actually gave them a strong leader, which was Moses, and even used his siblings as his aiders. Because, you know, he had a stuttering problem and Aaron had to speak for him. So the Lord is even saying, you can't say you didn't understand because I sent you Moses. And even though he couldn't speak well, I sent you I sent you his brother to speak on his behalf. And Miriam, even though she sinned, his sister bagged him up. Right. So he says, I not only did I deliver you, I gave you great leaders. Right. And then he says. Um, he says, uh, I, I, I gave you great leaders. When I delivered you out of, when I brought you out of Egypt, I even I even gave you great leaders. So I've been nothing but good to y'all. And then he says, and I also want you to remember the battle that I had with the prophet. Right? He's he's talking now. He's talking about the battle in five verse five. Oh, oh my people, remember now that Balak, king of Moab, consulted. And Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord, wherewith I shall come before the Lord. So watch. So now he's talking about um, the battle that happened and, 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 the, and, the, and the Moabites. That's why he says, uh, Balak, king of Moab. The Moabites was a nation, and this is deep. The Moabites were descendants of Moabs, but the Moabites in the, or, the, or, the, or Moab as a nation was the son of the incestuous relationship between Lot and his elder daughter. In Genesis 19, in Genesis chapter 19, verses 30 and 38, Lot's daughter said, Oh, we were our dad. There's no man that could come unto us and give us seed and da 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 da. And we are his daughters, and he has no sons, and we we bear no children, and there's no man to come unto us. So let us get our father drunk, and then when he gets drunk, we will lie with him, and we will bear seed so that we can carry on the family name. So, in other words, this was their plot, but it wasn't God's design. So the Moab, so the city of Moab and the Moabites are Abraham's brother, Lot, had a son with his oldest daughter. I mean, I, I know I'm getting deep and gruesome, but I'm trying to give y'all history, right? And and he had a son with his with his oldest daughter. His son and his grandson at the same time that's the mobite nation and so they were considered outcast outcast in the eyes of the lord yeah i know i got deep i know y'all probably who 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 passed oh my goodness that's a bit much to bear yes so the moabites were a outcast nation in the eyes of god and they really consumed a lot of sinful ways. They lived in the Transjordan on the east side of the Jordan River, River around the Dead Sea, and, and they were just south of like the Am the Ammonites. The land of Moab, uh, Moab was famous for like uh, pasturage and beautiful grass, and had a lot of agricultural wealth. So they had wonderful cows and sheep, and the the land was plenteous in agriculture. Had can grow good food, but the chief God, watch this, and I'm, and I'm giving y'all history for a reason because the Lord talks about it. The chief God of the Moabites was Kamash, and they worshiped Kamash and included a actual priesthood and sacrificial system. Solomon even married a Moabite woman, and he built a, a sanctuary in Kamash on Mount of Olives. And the climate was good for a bunch of growth, like I said, for wheat, barley, vineyards, fruit trees, and and the Moabites also worship 
the king Balak, well, Balak was the king, but they rendered to him, and Balak hired Balaam as his high priest. Now, I'm giving y'all some history for a reason. He hired Balaam as his high priest, and what he wanted to do, what Balak wanted to do, because the children of Israel were so plenteous and fruitful, he hired Balaam to basically curse the Israelites, right? But it didn't work because they were the children of God. So I'm giving y'all history context for a reason to tell y'all why Micah is saying what he's saying. So he hired Balak, but I mean Balaam to basically curse the Israelites, but they the children of God, and can't nobody just really genuinely curse them. So he thought he put a spell over them, right? And another thing, King Eglon, who was also assass assassinated with Ehud, Ruth, the widow, the uh, the, the widow of Machmalan of Boaz, Ruth became the wife of Boaz. She was a Moabite's woman. All right, so they were descendants of the children of Israel, but in God's eye, they were outcasts. But whoever believed in God was accepted. You know, later on down the line, and so. Balak was king, and he used Balaam, his high priest, to curse the Israelites, but he couldn't. So they had a battle and said, hey, you know, with the prophet, they had a battle. Hey, we're going to call out our guys, and whichever God best wins, that's who serve. And they were calling on their their their, their God, and, and, and if you read the, uh, the, the, the context, and um, it was like 1 Kings uh, 11 and 7, I think it is. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 7, and chapter 33. So they had this battle, and the prophet was like, yeah, call your God. And they said they, they were scratching themselves and scarring themselves and bleeding, and nothing happened. And then he called on God, and God sent the fire, birthed up the sacrifice on the altar. Ba -da -da -ba, that was that. So God proven to reign. So Micah is, is, is mentioning this situation. In five, all my people remember how Balak, king of Moab, consulted. He tried to curse y'all. And he used, he tried to use Balaam to curse them, but what Balaam ended up doing was blessing them. And they had this, like I said, they had this big old battle. At one point between, you know, and it it, it didn't work because Balak, as a matter of fact, Balak got mad. Because y'all read the story. Because I'm telling y'all another part of the portion when nation was against nation talking about call your guys and this, this, and that. But Balak hired Balaam to curse the children of Israel and he ended up blessing them because they, they children of God. So the word of the Lord came into his mouth and he blessed them versus, and he ticked Balak king a Moab off. He was like, I hired you to curse them and you going to come up and bless them. He was like, well, I can only speak what the word of the Lord gives me. Right? So that was just a plot. So Micah is talking about this. Micah is saying, the Lord is saying to the children of Israel, remember how they tried to curse y'all. And I even caused him to bless y'all that y'all may know the righteousness of the Lord. Look at, look at the end of five, six says, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and how, and bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings or calves uh, of a year old? All right. So Balaam, like I said, he was hired to curse the children of Israel, but he ended up, you know, blessing them. And now in six, he says, wherewith shall I come before the Lord? Here, Micah puts himself in the role of a, of a worshiping Israelite, right? That's why he's talking about it. He says, he says, well, well, shall I come before the Lord? If I'm worshiping him, how shall I buy my, buy myself before a high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offer, offerings and cast of a year old? What he's doing is he's showing them the custom by which they used to operate. They no longer have to do it that way now. And he's saying... If I put myself, this is what Micah's saying, if I put myself as a worshiper, right, I'm supposed to follow the tradition and have a one-year-old calf as a premium sacrifice because burnt offerings represented a person's dedication to the Lord or Yahweh in their times. And in a sense, the person was dying and giving themselves wholly unto God. However, the animal was put to death as a sacrifice. We know that. 
right? And he's saying, this is how you're supposed to approach God with respect. But instead, y'all not giving sacrifices in respect. Y'all not worshiping God with respect. Y'all doing the other. So you're not coming the traditional way, right? You're not coming as you're supposed to come with him, bowing yourself and respecting that he's a high God, coming with the burnt offering with the calf of a year old. Y'all trying to just give him whatever. Y'all doing whatever y'all want to do. Y'all not even sacrificing, right? That's how bad y'all are. This is what Micah is saying. Then in seven, he says, will it please the Lord with a thousand rams or with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Question mark. What he's, what he's saying here is he's using a hyperbole, right? And what Micah is saying is y'all so crooked that not only are you not respecting God enough, but if you're not coming to him with respect, you're doing nothing. So watch. So what he's actually saying, even if you had a thousand rams, even if you had 10,000 rivers of oil, if you're not worshiping, my goodness, y'all better follow me. If you're not worshiping God wholeheartedly and you still got all this sin you're doing on the side, it means nothing in the eyes of God, right? You're being disrespectful. You're not following the tradition. This is what he's saying. You're not following the tradition. You're not coming with a calf of a year old like you should. You're not bowing before him because he's the high guy like you should. You're not respecting him. Even if, even if you come with 10,000 rams, if you're rich and you can give all these sacrifices, <clears throat> come with 1,000 rams or 10,000 rivers of oil, if you ain't doing it right, you ain't doing nothing. So, so Micah is saying, don't think you all in the bag of chips because you sin and you rich to, to give a sacrifice. Because if your sacrifice is not coming truly from the heart and you don't really mean it, it has no, it has no, it has no point. Look, and then eight says, Have he, he has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what would and what doeth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and love, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Right? Micah is saying, if you got 10,000 rams and your heart ain't in the right place, you ain't doing right. Because what do God ask from you? And this verse, in verse 8, gives you the answer. Because Micah is saying to the children of Israel, God is saying, what is he really asking from you, for you? If you're not worshiping him with spirit and in truth, they didn't worship him, must worship in the spirit and truth. Then you ain't doing nothing at all. Because what is God really asking for you? He don't want your sacrifices if they're not truly meaningful and you're not worshiping him correctly. Because what he wants for you to do is respect him, worship him correctly, right? But the other half of it is God wants you to have a heart full of love and willing to do obedience, to, be ju to do justice. A proper relationship with God involves a proper gift of love to one's neighbor. So in other words, to love each other, to love your neighbor is a proper relationship with love. Having love and having mercy, this is what God wants from you. Not 10,000 rams of sacrifice and you ain't meaning it. Not, not 10,000 10, rivers of oil and you ain't meaning it. A thousand rams of sacrifice and you ain't meaning it. Or oh, 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 calf of a one-year-old and bowing down. If you ain't meaning it, it don't mean nothing. What the Lord wants you to do is be merciful, loving, and kind and to, and to live humbly. All of these are Hebrew words that offer in reference to Yahweh's covenant with Israel. He loves them. He's kind to them. He's merciful to them. He's loving. So he wants them to be the same. They're not doing that. But look at nine. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see my, thy name. Hear ye, Rod, and who hath appointed it? Now he's talking about Jerusalem. When he says, hear, O staff, there's two connotations to this, this, this phrase. He's saying, hear the old rod of the Lord, meaning Israel, or hear the tribe of the Lord, which is Israel. See, when he says, the Lord's voice crieth unto the city, he's talking about Jerusalem, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name, talking about Jerusalem. Hear ye the rod who hath appointed it. In other words, hey, Israel, listen up. Who created you and chose you? 
Who made you as a tribe? Is what he's saying. See, Micah is coming at them, but the Lord is through Micah. Look what he says here. Are, listen, are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is abominable? In other words, Israel, you're letting this type of foolishness in, right? Watch this. Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, and making thee desolate because of thy sins. I think that's obvious, y'all. Thou shalt eat and not be satisfied, and the casting down shall be in the midst of thee, and thou shalt take hold and shall not be, and that but shalt but thou shalt not deliver, and that which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. And thou shalt sow and shall not reap, and thou shalt tread olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil and sweet wine, but thou shalt not drink. For the statues of our... Let me stop right there. So let me go on down this here. Let me go down. He's, he's saying, listen, the house of the wicked, he said in 10. Now he's referencing to the children of Israel, and he's talking about the pride, most, most, most likely the tribe of Judah. Let me, let, me, let me get you right. Now he's going to the tribe of Judah. He's saying, listen. Your, tre your treasures that you are gaining is by wicked behavior. And the deceitful weights is the people who are becoming wealthy by abusing the poor through false scales and deceitful weights. I'm going to go there. They got these faulty, that what they were doing, what most of the tribe of people in the tribe of Judah, and the, which is basically like the scribes and Pharisees and the keepers of the law, and what they were doing is when people give tithes and offerings, right, they're supposed to give a certain percent or when they give certain sacrifices, what the priests were doing in the, in the nation of Israel is they had actual scales. So the rich would give their percentage, right, and it would measure out. This is no joke. The poor would give their percentage and they had faulty scales that they would use to take advantage of the poor and say, okay, you're supposed to give 10%. percent they like, I did. And they're like, no, according to the scale. You do, like literally they were doing this according to the scale. You, you didn't give tip it. You got to go back and get a handful more. And they're like, what? And they were doing this. And what they would do is the portion that they, the other portion they would go back and bring, they would pocket it. Or they would say, you supposed to give your 10%, but according to the scale, this didn't weigh out. Whether it was barley, whether it was money, whether it was wheat, whether it was the first fruits, they were saying, and then they would keep, they would take the portion that the poor would bring and they would, they would make themselves even more wealthier. So these faulty devices that they were using was increasing the profits of the merchants and cheating the poor. This is literally what the children of Israel were doing amongst themselves. The false scales were seen as a cursed thing in the eyes of God because what God demanded was true and accurate scales, the same scales that they were using for the rich. So Micah is saying to them, the Lord see your wicked ways and what you're doing and them just like them faulty scales, Look what he says. Are there, are there yet treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked? And the scant measure that is abominable? What y'all doing to each other is abominable to me. I shall count them as pure wicked balances? Shall I count them? In other words, I'm going to. You want to be wicked and have false scales? I'm going to. I'm going to judge you according to your deeds. And with the bag of deceitful weights, I'm going to judge you according to your deceitful weights. You're stealing. For the rich men thereof are full of violence. It's the rich folks doing it to the poor people. That's who God going to get. He's going to get the children of Israel, but the wealthy, he's coming after them. And their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. What they're doing is saying, ah, that don't measure up, but it does. They're lying. And the Lord is saying, in the house of the tribe of Judah, in amongst the children of Israel, I'm getting you suckers because y'all on that garbage and i'm gonna take care of it listen 13 says therefore i will also make them make thee sick and smiting thee you rich people that's taking advantage of the poor and making thee desolate because of thy sin so you think you're gaining but you're losing thou you shall eat and not be satisfied do i gotta explain that you shall take hold but you shall not deliver that which thou deliver, I shall give up to the sword. Whatever you think you're doing good and whatever you put forth, I'm going to make sure it's not profitable. You shall sow, but you shall, you shall not reap. You're going to plant in your gardens, I'm going to make sure don't nothing grow. You shall tread olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil. See, olives uh, was known to give off oil. That's how they, 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 they pressed them with their feet and it created oil. He's saying, I'm going to make them dry, right? 
Now look at 15. 16, I'm almost done. He says, for the statues of Armory are kept, and all the works of Ahab are kept, and ye walk in their counsels. Let me tell you what he's talking about. Right? The children of Israel was committing so much sin that Omri and Ahab, they were served as representatives of wickedness in the Bible among the Israelite kings. Ahab was the son of Omri and both of them was wicked. And the regulations of Omri like Ahab in the next call represents corruption. They were two corrupt kings. Omri was meaning servant of Yahweh. He was the founder of Israel's fourth dynasty reign. He was a king, but he was wicked. And so was his son. And what Jesus is saying, that you guys are still operating in the wicked sins of these two people, of these three people. I'm sorry, Omri and Ahab, two people. I'm sorry, I was right. All right. Ahab, meaning father is brother, he reigned, and he was the most wicked king to rule over the northern kingdom, primarily because he was the one that was married to Jezebel. Ahab was. The daughter of Ethabal, a Sidonian king, together Ahab and Jezebel attempted to make Baal worship the official region of, the, of Israel, and that's where the battle happened. Okay, so the Lord is saying, you guys are so wicked with all this de deceitful weights and taking advantage of the poor that you're still operating in the statues of Omri, who was wicked, and in the house of Ahab, who was the worst wicked king that y'all had. Y'all walking in their councils, and he says, and because of that, I shall make thee a desolate a desolation, and the inhabitants thereof a hissing. That means y'all going to be in so much pain when I'm dealing with y'all. That's what y'all going to be doing to stay alive. Therefore, you shall bear the reproach of my people. So in other words, all you are, the rich, because you're operating so bad, I'm going to make you burden, bear the burdens of everybody that's, that's poor. The poor people are already bearing poor burdens, and I'm going to make you bear their bur burdens. We thank you right now, God, for your for your word. We thank you for your knowledge and understanding your wisdom. We thank you for this Bible study, God. We thank you for all that you have done and you have been doing, God. And you're so good, you're so wonderful, and you're so worthy. You're so merciful to be praised. And we just thank you right now for that you are a good God. Bless everybody that is on here. Bless the Pittman family. Bless, uh, bless uh, Christopher Pittman, God, and watch over him and keep him strong and his family, his, 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 his sons, his daughter, his his mother, father, God, and be with him in the name of Jesus. And we thank you right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. I'm going to get up off of here. And uh, we are going to leave it at that. Bless the name of the Lord. I uh, hope everybody had a wonderful uh, Bible study. And it really uh, helped you for what it is uh, indeed worth. Amen. So.